my hope and prayer is that when we come to church, we leave motivated to live differently, amen? amen. To do differently, to grow as such. That's why we do the ministries that we do, such as our children's ministry, our AY ministry, which we have tonight as well here at the church. All the ministries we do together are meant to make a difference in each person's life, to call us to make a difference, to persevere, to overcome a determination that the world doesn't have, but you can have if you're walking with Jesus. Bow your heads with me before we get into God's word uh, here this afternoon. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for your loving kindness and grace. Lord, as we turn to you this morning, I want to ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us, grow us, and lead us, Father in heaven. We need your word in our lives. We want your word to speak. We need your Holy Spirit for that to be a reality. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 2. Book of James chapter 2. Hopefully you have your Bible. In fact, if we're reminded of the verse that came before that we spent time with two weeks ago, verse 27, the Bible says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. How easy it can be to let the world influence us, isn't it? I mean, after all, we live in it, don't we? I mean, Jesus prayed that we would not be of the world, but we still live in the world. And the world has its constant influence in our lives. Oftentimes when we think about the world's influence, we tend to think of the big stuff that happens to people. Oh, drugs, addiction, uh, heavy sins that beset us. But I, I don't know if we realize how much we are influenced by the world we live in. I'm going to give you an example. I was sitting in a religious liberty council meeting with pastors and our religious liberty department, and uh, the leader of the Religious Liberty Department was talking to us about how we're dealing with the different political environments and situations that have been taking place, including COVID, uh, the vaccines, you name it, uh, uh, down to the abortion, marriage uh, fights that have been going on. And it was interesting to sit down and listen to her say, you know, it's so interesting to see, she says, how Seventh-day Adventist Christians don't know who we really are. We would rather be educated, she said, by CNN and Fox News and the likes of those two rather than spending more time in the Word and even allowing spirit of prophecy to have an opportunity to speak to our daily lives. And you can hear it in the way we talk at church. And we think we know. But half the time as she goes from church to church... We have forgotten who we are because we take on the vernacular of, per se, the evangelicals. Or we take on the vernacular of the progressives. And because we think that either one reflects what a true Christian is, we plant ourselves in either of those camps. Not realizing... That the Bible, when truly you and I are steeped in it, 
doesn't care about any of that. That was never Jesus' chief concern. When he came and walked on his planet, his chief concern wasn't the politics of his day. His chief concern was the heart of his people. And I'm always amazed at how pulpits have been used to bring up more and more of the world's agenda and make that the center of what we talk about and what we preach. I don't want to talk to you about the world's agenda. I want you to know Jesus' agenda. I'm a Christian. I hear people say, oh, we need to hear that stuff. It needs to be preached from the church. I'm going to tell you what needs to be preached from the pulpit. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul came to that conclusion in his ministry. You remember that? When he said that I came amongst you in fear and trembling and I determined. He determined. There's that word. You got it? I de- In fact... Open your Bible. I need you to read it. I don't want you to hear me say it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You got to read it. Because some of y'all just listen, and just like the world, you think I'm giving you a good speech. My name is not Barack Obama. My name is not Clinton or any of those great orators we call in the presidential world, whether you like them or not. All right? I am not here to give you a good speech. That's worldly thinking. That's the ways of the world. And we got to reconnect with the ways of God. All right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Look what he says next. For I determined, what's the word? Say it again. Say it again. I determined not to know what? Whoa, not to know anything among you except what? Jesus Christ and him what? Crucified. What a lesson. He was determined that what the world needed was more of Christ and his ways in our lives and in our hearts. Don't you think if there was more Jesus in our homes that there would be, as I heard my wife lovingly tell me a week ago, that if there was more Jesus in our homes, there would be more Jesus in the church. And if there was more Jesus in the church, there would be more Jesus in the community. And if there was more Jesus in the community, then hearts would be changed and influence even the politics you like to pay attention to. But we're still focused on behavior and actions instead of the core problem. Until we are truly Christians, you will constantly complain about your life. And the world's environment. Oh, well, what about this agenda, pastor, in the world? What about the uh, agenda of, of the vaccine or the agenda of the virus or, or the agenda of the environment? Or the, I don't care. What about your eternal life? Some of us not only are not saved, we haven't saved anybody else for I don't know how long. You're freed and easy to talk about what the world is doing, but how many of you have talked and can freely talk to your friends about the day you met Jesus and what he means to you? Freely. And some of you can. But that's supposed to be the focus of the Christian. That's supposed to be where we're set and determined to be Jesus Christ and him crucified that 
is the center of which all other teaching in Christianity must stem from. And from this pulpit, if you ever hear a sermon that doesn't stem from Jesus Christ and him crucified, you don't need to pay attention to it. I give you permission to ignore it. That needs to be the center of who we are. We need power, and that power is not given by any government or any agenda. It is given by Jesus the Messiah, your Savior. When we come back to James, as I told you, the last verse of chapter 1, he said, keep yourself unspotted from the world, the influence. Man, if you can spend all that time here, what about spending that time in the Word? I've been talking to someone this week who is just on fire for being in God's Word over and over and over and just saying, I can't get enough of it. I'm shutting off this and I'm shutting off that and I'm spending time in the Word and I'm going through the Gospels and I'm learning and actually, I'm actually excited that somebody finally took my counsel and started reading the Gospels. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Somebody's listening. Because I'm meeting more and more Christians who've never read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we're going around calling ourselves Christians. Why? Because you know what happens before the end? I know the mark of the beast. I know about the Sabbath. I'm going to tell you something. If you know the Sabbath, but you don't know the Lord of the Sabbath, you're lost. You got me? There are, I don't know how many million Jews out there who keep the Sabbath. That is not going to save them. That is not going to change the way we live in a way that shows the world that we might be in the world, but we're not of the world. Now again, when we think of the world, we think pornography, we think drugs, we think this, we think that. All of that is included. But man, we can be just as steeped in the world and not involved in any of that. You realize that? I'm going to give you an example. James gives you an example. Look what's going on in James' day. James chapter 2 verse 1. He gives them an example. He says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ... The Lord of glory with what? Partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you will pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, <laughs> you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, what does he say? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You know that the early Christian believers struggled with prejudice and boundaries, ethnic and social, that existed in their time and in their world. Did you know that? From early on, James and even Paul had to educate early Christians that when God sees humans, he doesn't see Jew or Gentile. 
slave or free, Adventist or Baptist. You follow me? He doesn't see barbarian or scared. You know what God sees? He either sees a man or a woman who's a child of his or one who is not. Do you follow me? That is all God sees. And yet, it's easy to allow the influence of the world to begin to create in us all sorts of prejudice and discriminatory thoughts and behaviors that are not what God would have us live by, but by the influence we've been brought up or taught by what we've allowed in our lives. You see, in fact, if you check out Paul's writing, book of Romans, if you would, book of Romans real quick, chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, when Paul is talking to a group of Jews and Gentiles in his book uh, to the church, the gatherers, the people of God in Rome, he talks to them about final judgment. And Paul in Romans talks about the gospel, all of it, grace, God's grace, God's righteousness by grace, God's uh, justification by grace. But Paul even talks about God's judgment in the final days. And I want you to pay attention. I'm going to read a little bit ahead in order to give you a little bit of context. But really, I want you to focus when we get to verse 11. What verse? When we get to verse 11. But we're going to start in verse 5. Here we go. Look what he says. But in accordance... With your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance, what kind of we call that? What's patient continuance? What's another word for that? Oh! Perseverance. Yeah, determination, right? Who gets eternal life? To those, what's what he says? Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. wrath. That's what they get. Tribulation and anguish on every soul who does evil of the Jew first and also of the, of the Greek or Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. To the Jew first and also to the, to the Gentile. Now look what verse 11 says. For there is what? No partiality with God. God is not a respecter of persons. In other words, for God, he's either looking at one who is persevering in the faith he has given them, persevering to reach that prize, that goal, that eternity, or someone who is not. And you go, well, why did he say to the Jew first and then to the Greek? You know why he says to the Jew first? Because who had the word of God? Who grew up in the word of God? Who grew up knowing the God of the Bible? So you might say that in this world, God will judge each man according to his works to the Adventist first. And then to the rest of the world. I didn't get an amen for that one, did I? Because that one hits close to home. Right? Well, I'm an Adventist. I mean, I know the Bible. I know the truth. I have... Exactly. So who do you think is more accountable? The one who knows to do good 
and yet doesn't do it? Or the one who does good to the best they know how? Right? For God, there's no partiality. God doesn't see rich or poor. In James' time, as he was talking to the church, the big prejudice, the big hoopla, if you want to call, in the early Christians was that you have to understand, in those days, the church, this is, by the way, this is the one place in James that we see the Greek word synagogue in their assemblies, where we get the word synagogue. All right, which means to assemble. This is the first place we see that, the only place actually, that we see that term used relating to a Christian assembly. Where he calls them a synagogue. Now you have to understand that in the early church, the gatherings were not just used for worship. Gatherings were also used to embark judgment, to help settle matters and disputes among brethren, amongst believers, right? You want an example of that? Check out what Jesus taught his disciples. Of course, the Jews already had that as an example. They used their synagogues to bring matters before the elders and the rabbis in order to receive judgment. Jesus taught a similar thing in Matthew chapter 18, right? Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, just quick, so go to it and follow along quickly. Matthew 18, 15, he said, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Matthew 18, verse 17, here we go. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the? Oh, interesting, to the church. Let him be to you like a? He, uh, well, I skipped something, right? Tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him to be to you like a heathen and a what? And a tax collector. So Jesus taught that within the house of believers, we should aim to settle all disputes between those who are brethren, right? Those who are children of God. And, and, and that was in line even with the custom of the day. You would go to the synagogue to settle certain disputes. In fact, you hear Paul reiterate the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, right? And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look what he says in verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. We were supposed to be able to settle things amongst believers, right? And not necessarily taking things to the law and shaming God's faithful, right? Two people who claim to be bought and sold by the blood of the lamb, cheating each other, lying to one another, and then not being willing to repent or to make things right or to settle the matter, so they go to court, right? You see why I tell you the church is not a place just for a good speech. The church is a place where you and I are learning what it is to truly live. To truly live. What we ought to be doing and how we ought to be treating one another. And of course, as we've already discussed, you can't begin that life unless Jesus is your Savior and Lord. If he doesn't have your heart, 
then he can't move your life. That's your choice. All right. When you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, the Lord teaches us. And so as the Christian church was growing, not only were there prejudices between ethnicities, Jew and Gentile, but as you saw in the book of James, when they were coming in, and some scholars believe that this relates to the early settling of matters between brothers and sisters and brothers and brothers in the early church, using the church as a kind of a... Judgment hall as well to help work through problems as a, a conflict resolution area, right? We might say as arbitrators, right? Or, 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 or uh, as such, different ways to help them settle their issues. But what was happening in James's day is that when they were having these moments, a rich person would come in, right? And how did you know they were rich? Back in those days, they had the nice ring, right? In fact, if you read Paul's writings, you'll know it's even in the way they fix their hair, all the adornments that they would come in, the fine clothing, nice material, everything looking great. When they walked in, you knew they were of high class, right? Today, we don't necessarily judge people's uh, social status by a ring or by jewelry. Sometimes we might judge it by how someone drives, what they drive, right? Their car, where they live in, the house they live in, what do they do for a living, right? Are they lawyers or doctors, right? And so they come walking in the church, and the problem in the early church at that time is there was already a prejudice. What was the prejudice? Well, the, the idea was the church, people, that environment tended to favor those who were of high class, rich. And when the poor would come in, those who were needy or had less, they were not given the same honor and respect. They weren't treated as equals. And so the one would come in and would get a seat of honor, and the other one, it was just find a place to seat anywhere. But uh, you, Ron, we reserve this for you. <laughs> That doesn't happen today in the church, right? We don't tend to prefer some people more than others, right? There's no prejudice in God's house. We love everybody, right? Black, brown, white, rich, poor. Right? We tend to have that. And yes, that is all of the above. Because we are called to love all and to treat all equally, including those of the rainbow. Which the rainbow really is all about Noah and the ark, but we won't even go there. Nevertheless, the way it's been adopted in this world, they too are just the same as you and I, sinners who need the Savior. That is truth. We all need him. But we make those prejudice moves, right? We tend to flock to the people that think like us or look like us or act like us, right? We tend to flock one way or the other. And that's not what God intended to exist amongst his people. You understand? It wasn't meant to be there. Today, while we may not 
always have that attitude towards the rich or the poor, our prejudices take on various different disguises. And I've already named some of them to you. And then we find ourselves paying attention to political agendas and cries and justice. Depending on what we think, we flock to those sides, right? Evangelical or progressive, conservative or what is called supposedly progressive. I heard a preacher say once, the true progressives ought to be the Christians because we're progressing in Christ. But we let everybody else rob the phrases that we ourselves should be <laughs> showing the world, right? And so we reflect those prejudices in so many different ways. And today with social media, we find all sorts of ways to make things and statements and comments that hurt, that are broken, and that reflect that we ourselves are broken and hurt people with ideas about other human beings that God has not placed on them. Now, I want you to understand that God has not placed on them because here's the reality that you've got to understand. How do we learn how God views humans? How do we learn that? Right here. If you want to know how God views humans, you go to the, and not just some verses. You've got to know all of it. God didn't preserve 66 books just for you to know five of them. Or for you to know a few verses like people like to throw out there. Love one another. Yeah, but do you even know what that means? Right? The Bible makes that clear, right? What loving one another actually looks like. Oh, but the world says love one another too. Is that the same kind of love? I don't know. Is it? You should know the answer to that question if you're really in the word. Oh, the world says we got lo God loves us. Do we know what that means? You're not going to know it unless you're in the, the word. you got to know the word. That partiality that existed amongst people, the rich or the poor, if they were coming for judgments, imagine what that must have been like. If you were already favoring the rich guy, right, and the poor guy came in and they had a case and they had a concern. Maybe they were robbed or maybe they weren't returned something that they loaned to the rich guy, right? And they needed justice. Man, they walked in and it was already a, the court was already in favor. You already knew what it was going to be. And James says, absolutely not. In fact, that was very much what God taught the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Look at that real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Look what it says in verse 18. Well, we can start with verse 17 for context. Deuteronomy 10 verse 17, the Bible says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers where? Oh, man, you see where the partiality goes out the window? When you remember who you are, it's hard to treat other people less than you. You see, with God, God seeks true equality. 
which is another word that's thrown out there in the world and given all sorts of ideas and concepts. But I'm going to tell you how God views equality. It starts with we're all born in sin. You understand how equality begins with God? Well, actually, we can go a step further. Before sin, man was created in the image of God. So male and female reflected God. And everybody who comes from Adam and Eve originally were supposed to reflect God, right? But sin entered the world and it changed. And who did it affect? The same creatures of? And so it messed everything up. And it didn't matter whether you were black, brown, white, rich, poor, slave, free, however you were born, you were born in sin. That's God's equality. That's where it starts. So before we can even look at someone else's sin and say how horrible that is, we need to remember our own sin in the mirror and how we talk and how we act before we deal with them. Because it may not be the same sin, but guess what? Sin will still lead to the same place. It doesn't matter what it is. People say, ah, but you got to understand, you know, you can't judge people for the way they were born. Oh, you're right. God doesn't judge people for the way they were born. He judges people by their willingness to be reborn or not. Do you follow me? You've heard me say this multiple times. We weren't born right the first time. So you can't adopt that agenda. Well, I was born that way. Yeah, but Christ is offering you rebirth. And that's for all, everybody. And the world doesn't like that message because that message means I actually have to humble myself. I actually have to repent. I actually have to fall on my knees before someone greater than I and say, I don't deserve the life I have. God, from the very beginning, told Israel, you have no place to show partiality even to the stranger in your midst because you too experienced being a foreigner, experienced being a slave, experienced being under bondage, and you needed me to free you. That's the truth. I want to close with a story. Some of you know possibly quite well. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I said Romans. I meant to say Acts. <laughs> Acts chapter 10. That's always fun. Acts chapter 10. You know the apostle Peter, an apostle chosen by Christ to feed his sheep and change the world. But he was still a man who had to face his own prejudices, right? The apostle Peter, the Bible says... In Acts chapter 10, verse 1, had an encounter with God that he would never forget. In Acts 10, verse 1, there says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is 
Peter. He's lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now you got to love it because the Bible says, guess what Peter's doing during this time? Well, he decides he's going to go up. He's hungry. He decides he's going to go up to the roof to pray. Now, I want to start by showing you something. Cornelius was a Gentile. But Cornelius was looking for God in his life. All right? This is the way God differentiates. You understand? He was looking for God in his life. The issue wasn't that Cornelius was looking for God in his life. The issue is that Cornelius was a Gentile. Are you following me? That was the problem. It had nothing to do with his desire for God because God does differentiate between those who are seeking him, allowing him to work in their lives versus those who do not. Now, he loves all. Remember, the Bible doesn't teach universalism. Not all will be saved. There's no which one's ways about it. So Peter was up Simon the Tanner's house praying. The Bible says about the sixth hour, which would have been noon, 12 o'clock. What a time to be on a roof praying, Right? I don't know about you, but the sun is all up. I mean, hopefully, you know, if you look at those old roofs, they probably had like little coverings, right? Little things. I'm hoping there was some shade or something, you know, that in that roof. But, you know, he's up on the roof praying at noontime, talking to God, and all of a sudden, he's taken into a trance, into vision, right? Verse 10, then he became very hungry, wanted to eat. And you got to love this. God knows how to reach us in the moment to reach us, right? He's hungry, so God decides to use food as an illustration. It's probably how he could speak to me too, to be quite honest with you. If the Lord were to use food as an illustration, I think I'd probably learn quite a bit with that illustration. Why? Because I enjoy my food. My wife is telling me, babe, we're going on a diet, and I don't want to hear any complaining from you. And I just look at her like... Verse 10, he became very hungry, wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open up and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners ascending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call what? Common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, Peter wondered within himself what this vision he had seen had seen meant. And while he was wondering that, guess who shows up to the house? The guys Cornelius sent, right? We need to meet with Peter. And so Peter all of a sudden hears this, and it's like, wait a second. This is a Roman guard. Now, you got to understand. You really got to understand. The issues between Jews and Gentiles were like our issues between black and white. Or white and brown. Do you understand me? It was that much of an issue. We don't associate with them. We don't mess with them. They are unclean. Not because they're seeking God or not seeking God, but simply because who they, who they are. So Peter hears this, and you can read the story. All of a sudden, he realizes what the dream means, right? And I'm not going to tell you the whole story. When you come to verse 34, Peter ends up going with the servants to Cornelius' house. When he gets there and he finds out the story, right, of what is going on, then in verse 34, Peter opens his mouth and notice what he said. 
in truth I perceive that God shows what? No partiality. Notice, but in every nation, now watch this, y'all. Here's the key, because again, we want to make comments like the world, but we don't always want to pay attention to what goes with that. Look what Peter says. But in every nation, whoever, whoever what? Fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Are you following me? So who's accepted by God? Well, absolutely everybody. That's true. But everybody of whoever does what? Fears him. And does works of righteousness. Y'all, there is a difference between the saved and the unsaved. There's a difference. We were all unsaved at one point. But with Christ, that salvation is there. Peter all of a sudden realizes, wait a second, God doesn't care. That's not what he's about. In fact, verse 36 says, the word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of what? All. That word you know which has proclaimed throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things, which, we, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead and he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be what judge of the living and the dead you see the gospel includes good news and judgment to him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive what remission or forgiveness of sins now watch this while peter was still speaking these words the holy spirit fell upon those who heard the word and the jews that came with peter of the circumcision witnessed the outpouring of the holy spirit on these foreigners as they heard the gospel as they heard the gospel and Paul realized that God wasn't just calling Jews. He was calling them too. And they were baptized that day. The Bible is clear, my friends. There is no prejudice. There is no partiality with God. You are either a sinner saved by his grace or an unforgiven sinner who needs to realize your only hope is grace that's the only difference when god sees humanity and that's why in god's house i'm telling you like james made it clear to him who shows partiality you are committing sin transgression against God's law and if you have shown in your life prejudice if you have shown in your life partiality then I command you in the name of Jesus to repent to repent so that your sins might be forgiven repent Repent of that arrogance and pride that has caused us to adopt the eyes, the ears, and the mind of the world. Repent, for Jesus came to save 
everyone who will receive it. And the person sitting next to you, whether they're black or white, rich or poor, whatever color, whatever struggle they have in their life, they are one who your Savior shed his blood for. And that person deserves honor the way you should want it yourself. They deserve respect the way you would want it for yourself. That's the determined spirit that needs to pervade in the house of God. I am determined not to view one different than I am outside of a sinner in need of God's grace. And if we would live like that, I wonder how many more would find the hope, the love, the acceptance and forgiveness that comes with walking with Jesus. I want to be in that church, don't you? I want to belong to that. And I'm going to tell you, you've heard me call you to repentance today. If you have a brother or a sister who is showing that spirit in love like I have done, you need to call them to repentance as well. And call them to realize this is not the way. God has one way. And that way is following Jesus. I hope that's your desire today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. As you're talking to God, as you're listening with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, is there something in your life that you need to seek forgiveness from the Lord? Uh, we specifically talked about partiality and prejudice, racism included in that, but any kind of prejudice outside of how God views humanity. And if you're saying to the Lord, Lord, I repent today of that spirit, I repent today of any other spirit you know you have harbored that is not the spirit of Christ, I want to give you the chance in front of your guardian angels who cannot read your heart to raise your hand to heaven right now and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I repent, I acknowledge my sin and tell them exactly what it is. Maybe it's not the sin I brought up right here, right now that James has brought up, but it might be something else in your life. You know what it is. Raise your hand to heaven and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and tell him exactly what that sin is. Don't be generic, Lord, for whatever I've done. That's not confession. Tell him what it is you're struggling with, what character flaw you have that doesn't reflect Christ. Raising your hand to heaven isn't about showing me that you've made a decision. It's about showing heaven that you've made that decision because the only one who can see the heart is God. But you can show the angels, you can show in your own heart that you're reaching out to the throne room and saying, God, forgive me, cleanse me. I repent, I turn away from my sins, and I want you to be the Savior and Lord of my life. I don't want to conform myself to this world. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Is there somebody else? I've seen your hands. Is there someone else saying, Lord, change, transform me. Break that spirit in me. Whatever it is, that character in me, please, Jesus. I want you to be that Savior. And as you're listening, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, if you have not made a full commitment to Christ 
saying, I want all in. I want to be ready for a soon return, and I want to know everything there is to know about Jesus and follow him all the way. And you have never made a decision for baptism, decision to give your life to Christ. I want you to put two hands up. Others have one hand up, but perhaps two hands up saying, I need to be baptized in Christ. I need to be ready for his return, and he's calling me to do that. I want to give you that chance. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody else can see. If you desire that, two hands up to heaven to make that desire and say, God, I'm here. I'm yours. Amen. The time is now. The time is here. Today is the day to find a new determination in Christ. Father in heaven, you know those who are gathered in my hearing this Sabbath afternoon. You know those who have raised hand, both hands, and are saying, God, I'm through with this old world. I want my eyes on the world to come. I want my eyes and focus on heaven. And I want to make others realize that that's where their eyes need to be as well. There's a lot of pain in this world and brokenness, Father. You see it. You see what causes us to hold partiality and to hurt others the way we've been hurt. God, I'm asking you not only to forgive us, but remove that flesh from us. And give us new heart and a new mind. If there's someone saying yes to you for the very first time, perhaps they didn't raise their hands or maybe they did, I'm asking you, Lord, to not only seal that decision in their heart, let them let us know so that we can take the next step. God, move their holy, move through your Holy Spirit. God, you're calling us to be saved, to have eternal life. There's not a single child, human being on this planet, male or female, that you cannot save. Lord Jesus, I'm asking for that spirit. I'm asking for that surrender to you. God, there's nothing you can't do. There's not a heart, a mind that you cannot change. But you're a gentleman. You will not force your way in. So Lord, rub on our hearts and minds. Help us to be tools to rub on the hearts and minds of others. Making no partiality with whom we share the gospel with. But seeking to save every human being. No matter who they are. Where they're from. God forgive us again I ask. For where we have shown that spirit. Where we have let our attitudes and characters and agendas dominate our lives. Forgive us. Put in us the heart of Christ. We ask these things, we beg, we thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name. By your heads, receive your blessing yet again this evening as we seek God's face in our lives. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.